chaotic streets of Chennai offered perfect cover. This is where the child traffickers plied their trade, looking for what they regarded as pretty children. The stolen youngsters were sold to orphanages and then offered to families for legal adoption. India's extreme poverty and a market for overseas adoptions made its young a commodity. It's a lucrative business with a terrible cost, destroying lives both here and abroad. It's a confronting thought for any unsuspecting family that their adopted child may have been trafficked. But the truth is, hundreds of Indian children have been stolen and sold for adoption, and some have found new homes overseas. At the heart of this story is a difficult dilemma, but one Australian family decided to face the truth and to find out more. The result was a risky but quite remarkable journey. This village north of Chennai is the home of Sunama and her five children. It's a small house filled with love and hopes of a better future. But for 10 years, Sunama lived with an agonising loss. Missing from this home are her two eldest children. In 1996, they were taken away and sold by their drunken father for the equivalent of $50. The children, aged two and three years old, were traded by child traffickers. Sunama grieved, hoped and lost hope again and again. The uncertainty was excruciating. She didn't even know if her children were dead or alive. But Akhil and Sibylla were happy and healthy on the other side of the world in the suburbs of Canberra in Australia. I'm going to be flying out that you morning at about... Eight. Akhil, now 15, and his 14-year-old sister have become part of a family of eight children, including six adoptees. What's the weather going to be, Mum? When we're in Chennai? Yeah. Um, this time of year, because it's going into winter, it'll probably be a little bit warmer than it is now here. So mid-20s. Oh which would be quite nice. This is the first time I've ever seen you guys for real. And here you are coming up to the front office. Julia and Barry Rowlings had always first believed that Akhil and Sibylla had been given up by their sick parents. And that was me moving into the doorway and then you both took one look at me and stopped walking. You really didn't have any idea who this strange white woman was. This is the moment Julia Rowlings first set eyes on Akhil and Sibylla at an orphanage called Massos on the outskirts of Chennai. Oh, look at you. You are cute. Whether you like it or not, you are very cute. No. You look like a nerd. You look gorgeous. You thought you had very cute eyes. Oh, first kisses. Oh. <laughs> It was early days, but Sibylla was already throwing herself at her new mother. Thank you. <laughs> She'd spent nearly two years without a mother, and I think that all of those needs, once she had the opportunity to be nurtured and get that individual attention again, she was obviously still at a point that she was just going to thrive with that individual attention. That's one cute little girl, isn't it? But soon the Rollings began reading reports that the Massos orphanage had been caught up in a kidnapping scandal. <laughs> they started to doubt the story they'd been told about Akil and Sibylla's origins. 
that really was the hardest part in this whole process, was trying to decide whether we should look or whether we should just leave things as they were. It was the realisation as we were standing there on the crux of, of that decision that if we set forward, if we walk through this door, that's it, there's no turning back, that we're then duty bound to follow through to the end. So that, uh, that unknown was pretty damn scary. The Rowlings felt they owed it to their children to search for their biological mother, despite the dangers. My overriding fear was that we might lose the children, that there may be some legal avenue that we could end up in a situation that whatever our motives for searching might be, that we might find another family that were demanding the return of their children. After months of waiting, an email arrived from one of the Rowling's contacts in India. The message was short and shocking. Akhil and Sibylla had been taken from their mother and sold to an orphanage by their father. They felt they had to tell the children. Oh, the two words I just remember is the stolen and sold. There really wasn't any way of beating around the bush, we just had to find the words to try and say it um, as less brutally as we can, but you certainly can't dress it up in any way that takes the sting out. It's, it's hard stuff. Did you use the word stolen? Yes, I did, because I thought anything else that really wasn't explaining what had happened. The Rollings are planning a return to Chennai to spend time with Akhil and Sibylla's biological family. Do you want to take out the salads? This will be their second visit. Could you please give me a hand with the plates and stuff? Yep. It's very important for me because I really want to see them and spend most of the time with them. And yeah, I just really can't wait to see them and spend time. Yeah, do you think they're a bit tight? Yeah. Sibylla is also looking forward to seeing her birth mother again and the chance to teach her sisters some dance steps. Come on, have a look what you think. Excellent. Okay, now let's have a look at these others. Yeah, like, it's just where I come from and so that's another thing to remind me of, like, my background and everything. So you're quite proud of it by the sounds of it? Yeah. It's impossible to get an accurate picture of the true extent of child trafficking in India. But one thing is clear, it's been going on for years. In Indian terms, there's big money to be made and the temptations are everywhere. In the late 1990s, the child traders were brazenly kidnapping babies and young children from these streets. One lawyer claims that out of the 400 or so Indian children who found new homes in Australia in the past 15 years, at least 30 were stolen from their birth families. She looks the same, same as you. In a tiny rooftop apartment, I met Fatima and her husband Salia. Time hasn't diminished the loss and the anguish they feel for their lost daughter Jabeen. It was late in 1998 and Jabeen had only been out of her mother's sight for a moment as she walked along the street. The traffickers were looking for good-looking children they thought would be attractive for adoption. She was snatched from the street by a woman travelling in an auto rickshaw. Roy, me, I'm going to be a chick. Cardalic, 
जान समर दली की वही भी बस ताला के बस बोलिया we now know that Jabeen is alive and living in Australia. Is this Jabeen? I showed Fatima and Salia a photograph of their daughter, who is now 13. The traffickers changed the child's name and claimed she had been surrendered by her mother. She was adopted by an unsuspecting Australian couple who are now aware of the truth but have chosen to maintain their privacy. By law, we can't identify her. The case is now before the courts. What would you do if your daughter walked in the door now? To find out how a child snatched from the streets could have been adopted to Australia, I met Fatima and Salia's lawyer. The papers relating to Jabeen. Yeah. Geeta Devarajan claims Jabeen was sold by traffickers to an orphanage called MSS. She says corrupt orphanage officials forged the relinquishment papers. On plain reading of the document, it is something very fishy. This is a signature. Yeah. There is no proper uh, procedure or guidelines as far as relinquishment. Anybody can walk into any organization and relinquish a child. That is the existing procedure. organization where Jabeen is alleged to have been brought. The charity known as MSS runs a school and an orphanage. Police have claimed in court that in the late 1990s dozens of children were sold to MSS by traffickers. Most of them were adopted, some overseas. Jabeen was one of them. I confronted the president of MSS, Vatsala Ravindranath, who's been charged over the scandal and freed on bail. I showed her Jabeen's forged relinquishment papers that claim she'd been surrendered by a woman who was a single mother. Can you tell me who the witnesses are on these documents? Do you know them or were they just people off the street? There are staff only. They're staff? This person was expired yesterday, day before yesterday, it seems. What do you mean? He died. Which he one? He was a staff of us at that time. Mr. Suvaman? Sivaram. He died yesterday. Day before yesterday. The big flaw in the system is that the orphanages oversee the surrender of children without any adequate checks by government. It's an open door for the traffickers. Children are so vulnerable in that situation, especially poor and children who come from difficult background. This will not happen to any upper class, any well-to-do family. It only happens with poor families. The easy target is children who are on the street playing or sleeping and where the parent or working parents or they don't have a proper residence to protect the children from these kind of vultures. They just take the child and disappear. And once these children get into these orphanages, it's a big screen where you, nobody can penetrate. The MSS organization has now been banned from adopting children, but it still canvasses charity support from Australia. And in the past, Australian service organisations have been very generous. Well, really, the problem is that a lot of these children, uh, both in our case and in other cases, by the time the adoption gets to the court in India or in other countries, it's paper perfect. Everything looks absolutely correct and we had absolutely nothing to, to make us suspicious. 
Australian officials were warned against dealing with the MSS orphanage. This letter is from an Indian agency set up to scrutinise adoptions. It claimed the MSS orphanage had a history of misrepresentation, falsifying records, and even threatening the relatives of children in its care. The letter was sent to Australian Family Services Departments in 1995, five years before the stolen child Jabeen was adopted. What do you think about those people who stole your daughter and then sold her for money? What do you think of them? After months of planning, the Rollings are finally in Chennai, where Akhil and Sibylla were trafficked. And finally, Sanama gets to see her children again. It's an awkward but moving moment. The two mothers of the same children have a precious bond. This is Anwar, and Jean Basha, and Farida, and Zarina, and Zina. Akil and Sibylla's father fled after he sold them. Sunama remarried and had five more children before their father died. I said the smile runs in the family. Oh, yeah. After a cautious start, the two families warmed to each other's company. It's one of those situations that I think outsiders might find confusing for the children. The fact is the children have had absolutely no problem with the idea that they have two mums. What's the problem? She's got her hair layered and she's got bleached bits in her hair. Oh, colours. Is it difficult having two mums in a way? It is a bit because every time I say mums, Ami looks at me and I'm like, oh, not that mum. But yeah, it's a bit, but not much. I'll get used to it. The Rollings are staying with their new extended family for two weeks on this visit. They don't share a language, but they do share a deep love for their children. It's nice seeing all the kids now relaxed. It only took about half a day, but they're now all relaxed and in each other's arms. And as soon as you've got the kids doing something, kids just become kids and everyone relaxes. So it is lovely. It really is nice. After the beach, they head off to Sanama's house for the day to meet the neighbours. The Rollings pay all of Sanama's expenses, including rent, food, school fees and medical costs. We realised that if we made that contact, that no matter what the situation was, we couldn't then just say thank you and pack our bags and go home. How special is it for you to come to Sanama's house? Very special. And to all the welcoming. <laughs> Oh, 
But on this reunion, the Rollings and Sonama are also asking questions. How could it be that Akil and Sibylla were traded by a reputable orphanage? They've hired a lawyer to go to court to get hold of the surrender documents for the children. We think that it will prove our case that, um, that the children were not willingly given for adoption. Here we go. They want to prove that Sanama, an illiterate woman, did not sign the papers to give up her children. Basically, these are the documents that we're going to seek from the court. Yes. They ask and Sanama to sign her name to check it against the signature on the surrender documents. And is that what's on the document? No. It's not? No. OK. The name is perfectly written like this. Right. It's written it's in forged. script? It is. OK. It, it seems a woman a claiming to be Akil and Sibylla's mother may have a accompanied their father to the orphanage. Another possibility is that the orphanage itself was in on the scam. Who's that? I got it, yeah. Balaji Tangavel was in charge of adoptions in 1998 when Akil and Sibylla were here. Now you're smiling. He agreed to meet us. The biological father himself has signed the document saying that this is my wife. So we had to believe it. She didn't come and surrender those children. It's not her signature on the document, so maybe she didn't know where they were. Maybe she was denying the fact. Maybe she's denying the fact. So you don't believe Sonama? I don't. I don't. We don't believe Sonama. Sonama denies being there on that day, and the Rollings believe her. They paid the orphanage $3,400 during the long process of adopting the children an attractive amount of money for any cash-strapped institution. I guess the best case scenario I can say is that they were possibly involved with a, with a very unscrupulous middleman. Um, a worst case scenario was that they were complicit in the crime that occurred to Sonama and the children. <laughs> Officially, the Indian government has an adoption policy that favours keeping children in India. But in practice, the bureaucratic hurdles and the expense make that impossible for many here. <laughs> Vidya Shankar runs a foundation that helps Indian couples become foster parents instead. She says is that uh, she had approached many adoption agencies and uh, whatever conditions they were laying on, you know, for example, finances or uh, the conditions which they were putting down on documents and so many things, they couldn't comply, like property and those kind of things. It's a system that ends up working against local families and in favour of wealthier people overseas. How much is money driving this whole process? It's the only thing that's driving this whole force. This whole uh, system, it's the money which is involved. When money is in the agenda, nothing else gets in focus. It's pathetic. Fatima and Salia, the parents of Jabeen, the little girl snatched from the street, want her Australian parents to let them see her again. Fatima, Julia? In an effort to reassure them about Jabin's new life in a faraway land, the Rollings and Sanama have arranged to meet them. As a mother of six adopted children, Julia Rollings feels for both sets of parents, but her main concern is for Jabin. As much as I feel dreadfully for this family, the child that's the centre of all of this really has to be ready, otherwise it's not going to be a good outcome for anybody. And I'm very happy that our kids were ready for it. For Sanama, her loss of 10 years has had a happy turnaround.
I would like to come here every year or so just to see Ami and spend more time with her. And what about your little brothers and sisters? Yeah, I want to I wanna come back to see them as well and teach them more soccer <laughs> and yeah, and hopefully they'll learn some English so I can talk to them. Big smile. Three. Well, the fact is, if anything did happen to a tsunami, we definitely would somehow look after the children, whether that was making sure they were maintained in India or whatever was appropriate. We're in for the long haul. Our families are, are permanently connected now. The position I've come to in my own mind is I'm still very much an advocate for ethical adoption. I want to now channel some of my energy into making sure that adoptions that do happen are conducted ethically. I guess I'm not as naive as I was previously in just believing that the safeguards that were in place would necessarily protect everybody. No, 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 no.